everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of Nautilus Live live events for the 2021 season. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Megan Cook. I'm the manager of education partnerships and programs for the Trust and proudly part of the Corps of Exploration. And we are just days away from the launch of our 2021 expedition season. So I'm bringing together some teammates today, um, members of the Corps of Exploration leadership team, to talk a little about the exciting expeditions that are coming up for the next six months of exploration, and also to answer your questions about what you wanna know about where we're headed and what is ahead for Exploration Vessel Nautilus. Uh, we're really glad to have you here, whether you're tuning in on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, if you drop a comment into the comment box um, or a question for our team, that's the best way to get them through to us. And we'll be answering questions all throughout. So, you know, maybe drop in that chat right now. Let us know where in the world you're watching from and where you're excited to start live dives and watching those from next week. If you're a new subscriber to our channels, we're really happy to have you. Our team is on a mission to explore parts of the ocean never seen before, develop the technology and tools that it takes to get there, and use our missions to inspire and motivate another generation of explorers. So if you want to get involved more, if you're an educator, a learner, or just someone who cares about the ocean, um, this is just one of a series of programs that we run and opportunities for you to get involved. So you can check out our website, nautiluslive.org slash education, and check out um, all kinds of different ways to get connected with opportunities. Whether you're a classroom teacher, want to connect with the studio on board, uh, want to apply to come to see with us, or lots of other ways to get involved. So I encourage you to check that out and uh, get involved with us, come exploring. But as the team is prepared to launch, our 2021 expedition begins next Tuesday. Uh, the first mission will take off then, but we wanted to stop by here today for a live show um, and take you on a, a quick trip down to the ship and this preview of what's coming up. So I want to bring in uh, our chief operating officer, Allison Fundus, and we'll, let's all zoom down to sunny Southern California and visit the ship. Hey, Allison. Hi, Megan. Thanks so much. And hello, everybody from EV Nautilus. So as Megan just said, uh, we're actually off the coast of Southern California right right now, uh, preparing for our expedition that Dr. Nicole Renault and Dr. Robert Ballard are about to tell you about. Um, so we're out here actually shaking down all of the systems. So really just pre preparing everything for the expedition uh, coming ahead. In the past few months, uh, we have been very busy doing a lot of work to the ship to really enhance our capabilities out here. And so we can bring more and more exploration to you. Um, so some of those things that we have been doing have been uh, in enhancing the ship. So we've actually lengthened how long our ship is. Um, so if you're familiar uh, with Nautilus already, um, you can see that we have actually extended the aft deck of the ship by four meters, so about a little bit over 12 feet. Uh, we're also uh, installing new cabins on the bow of the ship so we can increase how many people uh, we can actually bring to sea with us. So we're, we're both enhancing the ship in, in terms of what we can do in terms of capabilities, but also providing more opportunities for people to come to sea with us. Um, we uh, also have been uh, busy uh, working on this room that I am coming to you from. Um, so I'm actually coming to you from a brand new broadcast studio that we have on the ship. We've embedded it directly into our ROV control center. Um, so right behind me is where all of the action is gonna be taking place on board the ship while we're diving and exploring the depths of the ocean. Um, so behind me uh, in the few, just a few weeks, our ROV pilots, our uh, science team, our navigators, our video engineers, and our science communication team is leading our exploration. Oh, looks like we may have dropped the connection with Nautilus. Uh, We'll see if they come back, but um, let me introduce um, our chief scientist who could tell us a little bit more maybe about the wet lab um, and the areas that have gotten some updates there. So let's bring in Dr. Nicole Reynaud, the chief scientist of the Ocean Exploration Trust. Hi everyone, it's nice to talk with the worldwide audience that is following us today. Thank you, Megan. Absolutely. So, Nicole, do you want to tell us a little about um, what we've done in the wet lab the last couple of years and what people might see there? 
Sure, so we upgraded the wet lab uh, two years ago, but it might not get a lot of airtime on Nautilus Live. Um, so hopefully we could show you a couple of pictures that show a completely reimagined layout to make it a lot more versatile for scientists to bring their gear in. So you can see we've doubled the amount of refrigeration space, which is critical when we're taking biological samples that need to stay cold. We have new chest freezers, also really important for, for freezing some of our samples. We have doubled the capacity capacity for chemicals uh, for scientists and that fume hood has been relocated so that it's a little bit more accessible to scientists working on the on the bench and not near the main access door where we're coming in and out with samples. So um, all in all, the wet lab has a nice improved flow and space uh, for scientists working at sea. Fantastic. Well, since we're shaking things down, uh, we'll see if the ship gets the satellite shaken out, but we'll keep moving and uh, chat a little bit about what's coming up the next season. So Nicole, how many expeditions are we about to launch? Yeah, we are excited to say that we're about to launch 10 expeditions this year. We just completed one. So there are 11 total, um, 10 to come that are focusing on science and exploration of the Pacific Ocean. And this is gonna be spanning six months and a large geographic region. Uh, as Allison mentioned, the ship is now in Southern California, but we'll be moving up the West Coast and working our, on a, our way up, um, including work off of Canada again, um, and then across the Pacific to Hawaii in the far Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So we're covering quite a bit of distance in the Pacific this year. It is going to be such an exciting year. I'm really excited. Let's um, let's dive in a little bit more and talk about what kicks off first. So on Tuesday, Nautilus Live will come live the way our fans and followers are familiar to seeing it with the live cameras, um, views of the back deck, views of all those upgrades, plus the best views, the views, views of the seafloor. Where do we head first? Yeah, so Megan, the next time you and I talk will likely be aboard Nautilus and uh, mm -hmm. that'll be quite exciting. We'll be off of San Pedro and then heading a little bit north to an area called the Santa Barbara Basin. This is an area that's you know right off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, a very populated area, uh, but it hosts a very inhospitable environment. So Santa Barbara Basin is an area that has anoxic to hypoxic waters due to the stagnant bottom waters, which means that it's toxic to most life um, but it supports a diverse bacterial and, um, and chemoautotrophic life forms that scientists are interested in studying. All right, explain for everybody tuned in, chemoautotrophic. Yeah, so they're using the chemicals on the seafloor. So what we're looking at here are some bacterial mats and some gastropods. Uh, this environment in the Santa Barbara Basin, these sediments in the bottom water have a lot of sulfur in them, things that we don't like, it's kind of stinky mud. But for the critters that live down there, they thrive off of it. And so we're working with a scientist from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uh, who is going to be taking a lot of sediment push cores. These are short sediment cores so that she can study the foraminifera that live in the mud um, and on the surface. And then we're also deploying a lander. Uh, this is called the Abyss Lander with uh, Professor Dr. Pete Gerges, who's actually joining us from land um, to be able to study the environment for a little bit longer time. So we'll be deploying it in July uh, next week, and then we'll uh, have it picked up by another ship in September. And in that time period, it will be measuring oxygen and salinity and temperature variability, as well as hosting an experiment in situ. So it will take uh, some sediments and scoop them into a little incubator, and the scientists will be able to um, use sensors that are continuously measuring changes to that mud. I'm so excited for that. You know, we'll wish the, wish the lander well and send it off on its way and off we'll head to our next expedition and it'll keep going on its own. So uh, where do we head after that? Yeah, so after that, we are off the coast of Oregon and Washington State primarily uh, in an area that probably many Nautilus Live viewers are familiar with, the Cascadia margin. Uh, this is an area that we have found thousand methane seeps, over a thousand methane seeps in the short time that we've been studying it. Most of those were detected with our multi-beam sonar on the ship. So very few have been visited by scientists, um, but we've been working with scientists at the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory um, and Oregon State University, University of Washington to study the individual uh, seeps as we're able to with the remotely operated vehicles. 
And largely, these scientists are interested in studying both the ecosystems, the organisms that live at these seep sites, but also the chemical variability uh, that's found here. And we found an incredible amount of variability, both with the depth um, as you go from continental shelf through canyon systems out into the um, abyssal plain to uh, latitudinal gradients. So as we go from Southern Oregon up to Washington, there are large changes in both the ecosystems and the chemical environments here. And another aspect of the seep studies that is really important is that it's very three-dimensional. So these seeps are emitting bubbles up into the water column and we'll be using the remotely operated vehicles to take samples on our way up uh, so that scientists can also understand the fate of those bubbles as they're transported towards the surface. This is always incredible to me, just to see bubbles rising out of the seafloor. It seems like they ought to not be there, but they're fueling this in a totally natural environment and a fascinating one. So, okay, we're going to hopscotch our way from Southern Oregon all the way to uh, Northern Washington, up to my home region, um, where we headed after that. After that, we're working with Ocean Networks Canada, so we'll cross the border and um, work with researchers at the University of Victoria and Ocean Networks Canada, scientists and engineers. And this is a really exciting area um, that we've worked with them on for six years. It's their long-term observatory. It's a great counterpoint to the ROV dives that we do, which are short in duration, but are you know traveling over different environments. Here, they've selected different environments, including shelf environments, um, ridge environments, uh, you know, the Endeavor vent fields, and they have these cabled nodes that have long-term uh, instrumentation to observe these sites. And we go there to help bring new technologies, um, do some maintenance, but also do some science with, with the scientists as well, taking samples and, and doing other work. Um, this year, we're gonna be doing some high resolution mapping of individual sites as well. So it's a neat mix of engineering and science that keeps this observatory running. I think we think of our ROVs often as kind of these platforms that go down to the sea floor and, and do science. But on this expedition, we get to see them kind of be, be multi-tools. Uh, suddenly they'll be carrying um, you know, their own sensors and samplers down, plugging and unplugging major seafloor infrastructure. It's a pretty amazing moment. Uh, we had a question from a viewer about our ROVs. Do you wanna talk a little bit about what makes them be successful at doing all these different things? Yeah, the remotely operated vehicles that we use, in particular Hercules, was designed to be uh, very configurable. So part of that is being able to accept different types of sampling gear. We know scientists have different interests, whether that's taking grab samples or push cores, having multiple boxes, having that suction sampler that has the eight chambers so that you can get discrete samples. But then the power system is also very uh, power and data systems are also very powerful. They allow scientists to plug in whatever types of sensors that they're interested in um, adding onto our vehicle. So in addition to our standard sensors like uh, CTD sensor, oxygen sensor, we also have the ability and we'll be using others this year, including a light sensor um, and things like a still camera. All right, so everyone counting along, um, if you're following along on the expeditions, we're up to, let's see, one, two, three, I think we're around four. Um, we can't keep going north. When do we turn around and head south? That's right. This is about as far north as Nautilus can go. Uh, unfortunately, for those of us who love the idea of going to the Arctic, uh, we will be turning back south now to head uh, back to Southern California. But in the meantime, we have a really important task here. We're going to be mapping areas of the seafloor that haven't been mapped before. Um, you know, 53% of the US EEZ remains unmapped. And so this is a critical part of our mission is contributing new seafloor mapping data uh, to both global and national initiatives for seafloor mapping. And the goal um, has been set for both to map the complete US EEZ and the world's seafloor by the year 2030, which is quite an ambitious goal, but uh, with you know ships like ours capable of going to sea and collecting uh, large amounts of mapping data, I think we can do it. I love it. I've always set those lofty goals and we'll see if we can get there. Um, when we get back down south, I want to introduce um, another person to the conversation and bring in um, Dr. Robert Ballard. We, uh, for all the fans, I guess, of robotics and emerging technology, these next expeditions are very cool. If anything has piqued your interest to this point, you can check out the Nautilus Live website and expeditions page to uh, learn more and see more about that. But in the middle of the season, we kind of change our focus for a little bit 
to bring in some new types of expeditions. So uh, Dr. Bally, if you want to come in and join us and tell us a little bit more about our new partnership with the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Yes, absolutely. Uh, those of you that have been following us over the years since Nautilus came online in 2009 know that our premier vehicles are Hercules and Argus that Nicole's been talking about and showing you pictures of. Well, recently uh, we joined a coalition of institutions that include the University of Rhode Island, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of New Hampshire, and the University of Southern Mississippi to compete for a national competition to become the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute for NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. And our charter is to not only continue using our remotely operated vehicle, ROVs, but to bring a whole new cast of characters into the game that are using autonomous uh, systems, both autonomous surface vessels, the one up in the upper left called DREX, uh, which is being provided by the University of New Hampshire, and underwater autonomous vehicles that are both underwater vehicles that work on the bottom, and then another one, Mesobot, which actually works in the deep scattering layer. The purpose of all of this is to increase our footprint of exploration. Uh, there's an old saying in the business, when you put two cables in the water, you tie a knot. And so uh, we have one cable with Hercules. So these other vehicles are really autonomous. And as we continue the development of this program, we'll be adding more and more, including the Eagle Ray from the University of Southern Mississippi and their Mola Mola vehicle. So the idea, uh, this is something that I've always dreamed of because I know that when I've gone on expeditions and I've been working something, I always wonder what's just over the horizon. And now we can literally release, a, I think of it as a pack of dogs that can go out hunting for us. And when they find something, they can literally come back and tell us what they found. Go back to that other graphic. So the graphic we had in a second, let me explain what we're talking about. So imagine that Hercules and Argus are down exploring. We then launch the, the Mesobot uh, vehicle and it goes into uh, exploring the deep scattering layer. It's able to go down uh, 1,500 meters, lock onto creatures that are migrating twice a day up and down as the sun comes up and goes down. And they're not known by the creature. So they're able to literally look over their shoulder and, and stalk them, so to speak, to see how they're, what their natural behavior is. Then they're able to either talk directly with Hercules uh, through an optical modem or an acoustical link, and that can then go up uh, up the cable on this on the satellite and down to Sinus on shore that can then react to those discoveries. The same is true for the uh, bottom AUVs. They'll literally go out, conduct exploration, and then come back. Now again, the Drex vehicle has two functions. It has the ability to map, much like the Nautilus can map, but it can go into shallower waters where we dare not go with our vehicle. Also, not only can it go into shallow water, and uh, it can also communicate with the other vehicles serving as an uncrewed ship. And this is really the future of exploration, much as we all like going out to sea. Uh, I'm now working with the Navy, uh, and the Navy, as you know, has a, a ship now called uh, a Sea Hunter that literally can uh, go searching for enemy submarines and do it with no humans aboard. So the, war, the, the future is really all about autonomous vehicle systems. Uh, we're land breathing, uh, air loving, uh, uh, warm loving creatures. And so if you look at the population of the world right now, 95% of us are standing on less than 10% of the planet. So this is because it's not very friendly to us at, at 20,000 <laughs> or in the polar regions or the desert regions. So what we're able to do is use these uh, new assets to as force multipliers, we call it, to be able to take us uh, as simultaneously to a variety of places and have that all networked back a show, very much like how NASA uh, operates uh, robots on Mars where there's no astronauts there. So this was really a new thing for us. So you can tune in when we do it, because we'll be I'm broadcasting this test effort uh, in September live on NautilusLive.org. You'll see how we're going to do it. And then it really comes into full force next year when we get over uh, to the Polynesia and begin exploring that region as well. 
Thank you, Dr. Ballard. As we think about um, this technology, I feel like there's maybe technologies people are familiar with, autonomy, um, the concepts of self-driving cars, maybe to self-driving robots in the ocean. Can you talk to us a little bit about what are the what are the key challenges to overcome? What are we, you know, really trying to test so that we can bring these forward to a stage that they're they're ready to go, ready to operate? Well, it's really bringing teams together that have never really worked that much together. We've worked some uh, with the University of New Hampshire. We just they just did an effort with the trust in in Thunder Bay, and they also were uh, helping us in our challenge Channel Islands program and also on our Amelia Earhart hunt. Uh, but some of these vehicles we've never worked with before. We've never worked with Mesobot. We've never worked with the Nui vehicle. We've never worked with a lot of the vehicles that are coming into play and just coordinating that dance and having them all uh, communicating. Uh, we don't want to have a Tower of Babel, so to speak, where they're all talking in different languages. So learning a common language, uh, learning a common way of operating is going to be the real challenge. Fantastic. That technology and teamwork, right? That it takes both of those. And I and I love you calling it a dance. I think maybe like hashtag robot ballet maybe is a thing we'll get we'll get going for all of these together. But again, um, everyone who's tuned in here, that is coming to you sort of right in the center of the season and will be available on Nautilus Live. Thanks, Dr. Bowden. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, Nicola, I'd love to bring you back in. So we are halfway through the season. We've kind of, we've worked our way north to Canada. We've come back down. We've brought new um, vehicles to bear um, and brought them into the mix and into the game. Where do we head after this? Yeah, after that, after all of that work with the uh, technology testing, we're headed across the Pacific with our tried and true mapping systems. So we'll be mapping on our way across. Um, there's certainly a lot of seafloor to cover. And every time we cross the Pacific, we're mapping new territory and finding new seamounts. And that's always exciting because we know that those are areas where we tend to find concentrations of life. Um, we will get a peek at some of those areas with the National Geographic deep sea drop cameras. These are cameras that are deployed by teams aboard the ship. Um, they fall to the seafloor and take video of the seafloor for a period of time while we're surveying around it. And then they're on a release wire. They come back up to the surface and we pick them up and continue on our way. But that video is really important because these are areas that people are unlikely to see otherwise. And so it gives us a glimpse of uh, what types of benthic and nectonic critters are living near the seafloor swimming past our camera system. Um, and again, the, the mapping is really important because it's supporting the Global uh, Seabed 2030 initiative. And we'll be spending some time as we get into Hawaii state waters, uh, mapping a larger area there. So um, also contributing a lot of mapping territory to understanding the US EEZ off of uh, Hawaii as well. It's pretty stunning. I would think everyone thinks about, you know, the state of Hawaii surely has maps of the ocean right around it, but there are still big gaps um, left for us to help cover there. Yeah, and we're very glad to be able to do that. Um, and then actually our following expedition is, a, is another seafloor mapping expedition as well. This one I'm really excited about. Uh, those of you who've been following for a while know that in 2018, we did some work in the Papahana Makuakea Marine National Monument, which is in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And uh, this is one of the largest protected areas in the US and um, largely unmapped and unexplored. We'll be going up there uh, on a mapping mission to create the first map of a series of seamounts called the Lilikalani Ridge Seamounts. And what's interesting about this area is that they are a seamount chain that we don't know how they formed and they have an interesting and intriguing fork to them. So um, there's some debate about uh, you know, how they formed and we'll be uh, getting the first seafloor maps so that when we come back in 2022 with the remotely operated vehicles, we'll know exactly where we want to dive. So we'll have you know, several months to pour over the new mapping data and select dive sites. Nicole, we had a question come in from a viewer. Is our data available um, to the public? Where does this go afterwards as we talk about you know, revealing these features for the first time? 
Yeah, that's really critical and central to our mission. Um, all of our data is made available, and the mapping data in particular is made available through NOAA's NCEI, National Center of Environmental Intelligence. Um, the seafloor maps are also processed on the ship by, by people who are working in real time to create the seafloor maps, and those are quickly contributed to the JEBCO Seabed 2030 effort. So they're almost immediately put into these global grids um, to help you know, produce new maps of the seafloor. Uh, so you can find our mapping data at NOAA NCEI, and you can find our other data at the Rolling Deck to Repository, um, or R to R, which is a, a great database that you could look up Nautilus and find all of our cruises and kind of click through where we've been, see the dive tracks and, and where different data resides. All right, and we don't have to, you know, look too far into the future here that we'll be mapping and then returning to some of these sites in 2022. So we're really kind of teeing ourselves up in a lot of ways for future exploration. So you can see some of those mapping products also on our social media. We'll tweet out the um, data we have available to help give the context before we launch the ROVs of where we'll be and, um, you know, what you can expect from the dive ahead. So uh, after we do this mapping, back-to-back -back mapping expeditions, we get back to ROVing in the fall. Tell me a little bit about that expedition. Right, we'll be back in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, but this time at the southern end of the expanded area uh, to look at some seamounts that we believe are an extension of the Wentworth seamounts. Now, you probably need a map to understand this a little bit. Uh, the Wentworth seamounts are actually at the far northwestern corner of the monument. Um, and so these seamounts are a little bit to the southeast and there's questions about where they originated. These have been mapped before, so we've already planned out where we would like to do ROV dives, which this image is showing you. Um, and, you know, we're looking to understand the origins of the seamount by collecting rock samples and doing things like age dating, but also looking at the mineral crusts and the microbes that live on those crusts. So I know a lot of times we talk about the coral and sponge communities, which we're very interested in understanding here as well. Um, but we're bringing a specialist, Beth Orchid, to look at the microbes that are living on these crusts um, on the on the seabed, and uh, you know the ecosystem services that they provide support the larger ecosystem seam, the larger <laughs> seamount ecosystem. Sorry. So it's really important that we understand everything from the very small to you know, the macro scale here. And so those are some of the spectacular uh, coral communities that we found in the past that we are likely to see again on these seamounts um, as they concentrate uh, hard ground that's critical for, for coral and sponge. These, these are some of my favorites, you know, that we find corals um, out in the Pacific that are a thousand years old, and there are some that have been aged to over 4,000 years old that live in the Pacific. So you get to see these apex kind of communities um, on a seamount, which for viewers and fans at home, a seamount is a mountain underwater of a certain size. So if you like hiking, mountaineering, whatever is your favorite land activity, you can just picture that same kind of landscape, um, but underwater in the dark. Yeah. The ROVs become mountaineers for sure. And they're, you know, going up these seamounts with a flashlight and some samplers uh, while they're while we're exploring with them. Absolutely. So take us, we are now at 11 of 11 after shakedown. Where are we gonna finish the season this year? Yeah, sure. In December, we will be doing an expedition that's just to the Northwest of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and it's called the Chautauqua Seamounts. These are, you know, for seamounts that are fairly close to the main Hawaiian Islands, still completely unexplored, and that's um, pretty incredible to me. They're a J-shaped uh, seamount chain that uh, one of which the northernmost falls within the monument. The rest are just in um, Hawaiian state waters, and we're interested in these seamounts because they are so unexplored. We don't know much about them. There's a scientific paper published in 1968 that um, scientists had dredged up some rocks and they think the seamount might be Cretaceous age, uh, which places them older than the nearby Hawaiian Islands. So again, it's throwing into question, how did they form? And when you look at the tapestry of the Pacific Ocean and you see all of the seamounts um, in, in the Pacific, you, you know, there are different ways that these have formed, but in most cases, we still don't know how. Uh, and so one of the important things here is grabbing some rock samples and, and working with geologists to figure out their ages and 
Um, again, looking at the mineral crusts and how they've formed on these rocks, because that also tells you something about, uh, you know, how, how the iron manganese is forming in this region in the various depth zones that we'll be traversing with the ROVs. All right. If you're watching, drop your questions in the chat. We want to bring them in and bring them in the conversation. And I, I have the first one. Uh, Nicole, could you tell us a little more about um, when we say we're aging and dating these rocks? Like, can you pick up a rock and look at it with the ROV cameras? Can we pick it up on deck and look at it and, and know what kind of ages we're talking about? What's that process look like? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, first of all, rock sampling is one of the big challenges that remains uh, in the deep sea. Many people might be familiar with our 2018 uh, gecko gripper that we brought into the Marine National Monument to, to test out for, for grabbing rocks, rock samples. But because of that iron manganese coating that forms on all deep sea rocks, they're kind of glued together. And they all look uh, very similar. They've got that, that black coating on them. So we have to pry them loose, bring them to the surface, and then cut them um, to make sure that they're unaltered, they're rocks that are capable of being dated, and we send them to labs, and uh, typically there's argon-argon dating done uh, to the interior of these rocks. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll get that get that information back after the date, um, but certainly, you know, exciting for us to be there. These are, you know, these are the expeditions that I dreamed about enjoying the team, right? We're going to somewhere that has never been explored. We are going to have um, a glimpse at what the landscape, the seascape, seafloor shapes look like, what the biological community looks like. We'll know so much more by the time we finish a 10 day expedition than we, than we ever did before we started. Um, someone wants to know, Dana from Facebook would like to know, um, are we going to be doing long dives? Um, what kind of duration dives do we expect through these? Yeah. This year, we expect to have a full range of dives. Um, you know, this very much depends on what the lead scientist for each expedition has in mind for a pace for their dives. Um, I can think right off that the first two expeditions that we're about to have, scientists need to get a certain sample payload to do their research. And so we'll be cycling the ROV pretty frequently just so that we can um, bring the sediment cores or the, the gas and water samples uh, to the surface for scientists to process and then you know get the ROVs back in the water. Uh, so those will be on the shorter side, maybe four to eight hours for some of those dives. But then we get to areas where we haven't explored before, especially when we get out to Hawaii and the Pacific. And some of those dives can definitely span you know, a full 24 hours or more. Uh, we wanna be aware of the time that we're spending in the water column as well and try to optimize uh, by spending a longer period of time on the seafloor so that we can get as much exploration and you know visuals on the seafloor as we can while we're there. Perfect. Um, let's do some more questions. Uh, Maureen wants to know, can you see a school of fish in a seafloor map? You are a mapping expert. <laughs> yeah, so we collect what's called the water column data as well, and you certainly can see signatures of fish. Now, there are specialized sonars that will be able to help scientists understand um, more about the schools of fish or the types of fish that are being seen in the water. Our multi-beam sonar is more focused on uh, detecting the seafloor itself. So the collection of the water column data tells you that something is there. And in the example of fish, you can usually see, um, you know, little blips uh, on, on the, the mapping data. Um, in the in seeps, you can see here, it rises very prominently from the seafloor. And that's how we're able to detect these methane seeps on the Cascadia margin is that it's a very strong signal uh, that tends to be very constant over time, whereas fish tends to be more transient. So that's a very great question. Awesome. Uh, let's bring Dr. Ballard back in. We have some questions uh, for you as well. Uh, we'll pull him into the conversation. Hey there. Hi there. All right, Dr. Ballard, what is the maximum depth of our ROVs and how deep have ours gone? Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Hercules plus the new Little Hercules? Absolutely. Uh, when we were working in the Mediterranean, when we first got the Nautilus, it's a relatively shallow uh, 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 sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, our vehicles could dive to 4,000 meters, which is about uh, uh, 13,000 feet. Even when we got into the Atlantic and the Caribbean, uh, we were able to get to most of the places we wanted to get. But now that we've entered the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, what you need to know is the bigger the ocean, 
the heavier it is because it's made up of oceanic crust, which is a lot heavier than continental crust. So as oceans grow, they get heavier and deeper. So now we're wanting to get a capability that will take us to 6,000 meters or roughly 20,000 feet. 20,000 feet is 98% of the world's oceans. So we have several of our vehicles capable of going there. And we just put a cable on just a few days ago that now makes it possible to get to 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters. And that's our small ROV, Little Herc. Uh, Argus can go that deep and at Atlanta, another smaller Argus vehicle can go that deep. So three of our four primary vehicles can go to uh, uh, 6,000 meters. Our goal is now that we've, after we spent so much money on the Nautilus, uh, we can now start redirecting some of those funds into building a Hercules II. And that one will be able to go to 6,000 meters. Just robots on robots on robots. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Rose. All right, next question um, comes from Jacob. Is there anything you really want to see this year? Uh, maybe Dr. Valley, then Nicole? Well, I want to see all these vehicles dance. <laughs> That's basically what I, you know, this is what we're trying to do has never been done before. And we love challenges. We're always pushing the envelope. And naturally, uh, we're nervous, but we always, exude sense of confidence so but when people are watching you live it, it, it's a little nervous so tune in and watch us dance <laughs> that's great nicole what are you uh looking forward to seeing this year well you know i'm really looking forward to seeing the first mass of those seamounts and the reason that uh really excites me is because the area right now has some satellite anomalies that are showing some pretty shallow summits on some of those which uh, could, you know, result in some interesting implications for fisheries out in those regions or, you know, um, commercial fishing species, but also because we don't know the shape of the seamounts. So some will end up being guillots, some will be more conical and ridge-like. And so when you get those first maps and you can uh, take a look at it and then compare it to what was there or what we knew before, it's uh, really exciting to see the, the differences that those seabed maps make. All right, what's a guillot for everyone at home? A geo is a seamount that used to be subaerial, so it was above the surface at some point and then, you know, uh, subsides through density processes uh, over time. Yeah, there's a fascinating thing about the Hawaiian island chain. It's called the Emperor Seamount chain. It goes all the way across the Pacific, makes a turn, and then heads into the Aleutian Trench where it's being consumed. Uh, but that chain was made by a hot spot, we call it. Uh, a, 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 we affectionately refer to them as thunderheads of the mantle. So these are of deep disturbances within the earth that blast up from the mantle. And then as the plate migrates over it, it pops out islands. And naturally we know that the hotspot is presently on the big island of Hawaii. But as those old islands move away, they get colder and they actually sink back down into the ocean. And so that's uh, why only the newest islands are above sea level. The oldest ones have sunk back down. That's awesome. You can, everyone at home, anytime I'm describing seafloor geology, I always feel like we should do like hand motions with it, that you're like conical seamount, geo, hotspot, volcano, <laughs> you know, you can follow along at home with those. Uh, if you're, if you be like me on like the hand, hand signs as we go. Um, well, a lot of questions coming in about how people can get involved. Nicole, do you want to talk a little bit about our internship program? Yeah, sure. So we bring out university students, uh, community college students through our internship program, and that's a great way to get involved. Uh, there are applications usually at the end of a year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we're, we're, we've deferred a, a, actually a cohort for two years now. Um, but if you're a student who studies science, engineering, um, you can come out to see with us and uh, videographers as well. So we have uh, sort of different flavors of internships and you can find more information on that on our education page. Absolutely. And if you are an educator and um, interested in getting involved or a scientist who would like to participate in our program, um, Ashore, there are lots of resources and ways to get involved there too. We have at -sea programs for educators, but we also have over a hundred different um, activities and fun education resources. Everything from the BuzzFeed style quiz, where you take a little online quiz and it tells you what career you might be a great match for on Nautilus, 
or all the way up to um, curriculum and connections for teaching in the classroom if you are an educator. Um, I also want to point plus, out our live. Plus, plus Ooh, this yeah. year, you guys okay. just put all of our curriculum in Spanish, which Reen is really super. So uh, recognize that we're now bilingual with our curriculum, which really reaches even a larger audience. We're really proud of that. And you'll also see that on our highlight videos. So if you're checking out the YouTube channel um, or Nautilus Live, you'll see we're, we're working our way through the back catalog, as you'd say, but we have started with our most popular um, uh, videos are all captioned in English and Spanish now. And uh, you'll just see more and more of that along the way. So keep your questions coming in um, as you see them or as you have them pop up. Uh, let's go to another one. Let's see. How often do we find new species? Nicole, you want to take that? Yeah, almost on every cruise, I would say. And, and you know, that's one of the exciting things about moving back out into the Pacific. Uh, in 2018, we collected 45 biological samples in the Seamounts uh, expedition that we did. And there were over a dozen new species that have just been described or being described by scientists right now. So especially as we go out into these regions, um, we're finding new species everywhere we go. And that'll certainly increase with Mesobot now when we're going to be able to, they, the 95% the of all the livable space where creatures can live is the midwater zone of the deep ocean. So we're now entering a world where I'm, I, we're going to be making a, a discoveries of new species on a regular basis. It's so exciting, you know. As quickly as quickly as scientists can characterize, um, we are out there making those discoveries. Um, a question from Chris: Will we be streaming live on YouTube? Yes, you'll be able to see the dives on YouTube as well as YouTube has hour by hour segments. So if you know you just can't handle the whole dive and you just want like a minute or you know one hour of an expedition, or you're trying to go back and use. Um, maybe for a research project or for science to check out the hour by hour dives. You can find all of that on YouTube and uh, more behind the scenes of coverage of the expeditions on social media as well. Let's see. Uh, a question from Alicia. Do you have a plan if you find something you want to stop and study? Do you want to talk through a little bit, you know, what happens when we find the unexpected? Well, that's a, an amazing part of our program. We call it the doctors on call or experts on call. Sort of recognize that we are boldly going where no human has gone before. So discoveries are constant, just as Nicole uh, made mention of. So what we do is we have scientists who are willing to be awoken because we work 24 hours a day. And in some days we're actually down for three days at a time. So we're constantly exploring. So let's, uh, uh, let's take a discovery that happens at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, in my life, it seems most of my major discoveries always took place at two in the morning. So it's two in the morning on Sunday and we make a discovery somewhere. We will be able to deliver the an expert to that spot in a matter of minutes because they've all signed up. We have a, a lead scientist on all expeditions, on all watches that has a book of experts willing to be called and they can be called. We'll call them. They'll be in bed. We'll wake them up. Uh, explain that we've just made a discovery. They tend never to be angry about that. And then they boot up their laptop while they're in bed. We're able to stream the discovery on their laptop and talk to the pilot and, and then it, if they're really excited, they get up and run to a command center. We have uh, different command centers. I have one uh, only 15 minutes from my home. So if I get called, I can run to it. So that's how it works. And it's been very effective and we use it a lot. Nicole, what happens next after that? A question came in about following up on a sponge someone had seen last year collected. So the discovery is made. We have the experts on the line. They say, this is, this is spectacular. This has never been seen before. We collect it. Where does the rest of that story go? Yeah, so it goes straight to the researchers. I mean, if we've identified someone who has the resources to identify and work with the specimen, then um, at least part of it will go to them, if not all of it. And then from there, it can go to a repository. We work with the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. Uh, they have a fantastic repository of all of our samples dating back to, oh, I think 2012 in some cases. And uh, what that means is that a scientist who's looking for a deep sea sample can go to their database, type in what they're looking for and find it, request it and have it sent to their institution so that they can study it. 
Amazing, amazing. Okay, I have one more rapid fire question for both of you. Um, thank you both for you know sharing your knowledge with our fans and with our followers and getting us so excited about the season ahead. Um, my last question for you is favorite on watch snack. <laughs> popcorn, well buttered popcorn. I'm known for running down and making sure the watch always has warm, fresh, buttered popcorn. I can attest to that. It is. It's always nice to get a popcorn treat. But my favorite is when people bring chocolate bars. Awesome. And we're um, lucky that the chef makes fresh pastries, so we also have cookies all the time. So uh, don't worry about us. And there's always <laughs> a food 24 hours a day on the novel. That's true. Fact, we, we have to use the gym a lot to stay in shape. Also true. So if you have a favorite Nautilus snack, we drop it in the comments and chat. We'd love to know what you, you know, snack on to stay awake at all hours to explore with us. Uh, but thank you so much, Nicole and Bob. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if you are excited about what you heard today, um, we hope you are. We hope you cannot wait to be with us for the rest of the season. Check out NautilusLive.org. The live stream starts on Tuesday and our first dives um, will be just will be Tuesday. They'll be that afternoon um, as we depart from San Pedro and kick off our 2021 season. Uh, if you do want to read ahead, if you're intrigued by something you heard, check out the expedition pages on the website. You can learn more about the science teams that are coming out, some of the technologies and tools that we'll deploy this season. And it's a great way to kind of read ahead and preview it. Also, if you are one of our subscribers here on YouTube, um, stay tuned to your notifications because we're going to be doing a lot more of these live event series uh, where you can get to know the scientists, ask their questions, and kind of preview before an expedition starts on the ship what you're going to see on the live stream by following along. So our uh, first of those, or our next live event, will also be on Tuesday. And we'll bring together uh, both artists and scientists um, for a program called uh, Big Reasons to Love Tiny Forams. And we'll learn all about foraminifera, which will be a big part of that first Santa Barbara Basin expedition. So keep up to date with us. Uh, stay tuned with the up-to-date information about our mission by following us on social media and tuning in on Nautilus Live. And we can't wait to start exploring with you just around the corner. It's gonna be a great season and we'll talk with you all soon. Thanks. <laughs>